the book of Ephesians. And I've entitled this All Hands on Deck. I believe a subtitle of the book of Ephesians could easily be All Hands on Deck. It certainly doesn't encompass the whole of the book of Ephesians, especially the first three chapters that focus on what God has done for us in Christ, how he has brought Jew and Gentile together. And the last three chapters, certainly, I think you could easily subtitle All Hands on Deck. And so the next slide, if you'll turn to it, I said it's a Navy term, All Hands on Deck. Probably most of you are aware of it. Um, and it's when there's a situation that has arisen Sometimes it's an opportunity, sometimes it's a need uh, that there is issued, and it means that everybody who is even remotely available, whether it's your turn or watch, meaning um, I guess they, they function in teams, whether your team has just finished its watch or not, all hands on deck intends to mean that everybody, everybody who's remotely available, we need you, we need you on deck, we need you available to do what we find ourselves in the midst of. And I mean that sometimes it's a great emergency. And at this point in time, I don't mean it for us as a congregation in a time of great emergency. Yes, but that's not the focus. And I, I want to briefly bring us to where uh, what I think is taking place, what I think God is doing, and to join us, to join all hands, to be fully a part of what is taking place. It is something that you say when everyone's help is needed. All of our help, everyone's help is needed. It is the grand design of the body of Christ. It was God's intention that everybody is needed for what he is doing, what's coming into being. So I have put here uh, Ephesians. This, over the past several weeks, um, I'm trying to increase the amount of time I spend praying in the Spirit. And uh, two things, two thoughts have come to me. So that's the real intent today is to express these thoughts from the book of Ephesians. The first is putting the armor of God on daily. Just how do you do it? How do you put it on? If you remember, we had a speaker, oh, six, seven months ago, uh, a Mr. Marzulli, who gave us four points of uh, encouragements, and they were to put on the armor of God daily, to increase our prayer life, to deal with habitual sin, and to step on the front line. I believe those were a, um, a, a, a group of four suggestions, recommendations that I think, I think they were prompted by God. He may be using them all over the country in every meeting that he goes to, but I believe they were prompted by God. And so uh, over this past month, two months, three months, four months, five months, I don't know how many time, how much time, many times I've done that. I've put on the helmet of salvation, didn't really put it on in the order that it occurs in Scripture. I would always start with the helmet of salvation which is one of the last things, at least according to the listing in Ephesians 6, uh, and the breastplate of righteousness, and I would kind of go down, uh, loins gird with truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, and it doesn't mean more than anything else, above all, its connotation is much more in the original, it is overall, covering all, big, shields were big, and they were to cover all, above all, uh, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And um, as time went on, I thought, there's got to be more than putting the armor on than just saying those words. There's got to be more. It is, is all that it is just saying the words. And especially in context of the book, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians uh, was written from prison. Paul was in Rome. He was in prison. Commentators say he was chained to a Roman guard. Uh, and that's, that was the style of the Roman prisons. And he was writing some of the epistles. And uh, he wrote to the Ephesians and he wrote Philippians. He wrote Colossians from that prison setting. This is one of them. And it was written to G Gentiles, not Jews, but Gentiles, that were in Ephesus. It was intended to be a circulating letter, so it made it to all the other churches, but it's Paul the Apostle in prison writing to Gentile Christians that would that letter would make its way to the broader church than just the church at Ephesus, but that's who it was directed to, and would then encompass Jew and Gentile because the thoughts, it's real clear, it's trying to address Jewish thought as well as Gentile thought. And uh, if he really was chained to a guard, 
uh, which probably almost any commentator you read, that'll be the idea that is given, uh, that he was chained to a guard. He was watching a Roman soldier and maybe dressed in his full garb, maybe not. And so some of the warfare terminology of Ephesians chapter 6 almost is that's the setting that he was in, chained to a guard, uh, dressed, who knows how that guard was all dressed. And I've thought over and over, now how do you put the armor on? Is it just saying those words? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So absolutely, and the Word is real clear from many places, is to be spoken. One could say, one could point out, absolutely, that's a way you do it. You speak it. You speak those scriptures. You speak them. You turn them into a confession over yourself. Absolutely, I would say that is an excellent starting point. So you wake up in the morning and you're following L.A. Marzulli's counsel because you believe it's also very scriptural to put on the armor of God. So you get up Monday morning and you put that on, you put all the armor on and let's do a hypothetical situation. So the first one that's actually mentioned uh, in Ephesians 6 is the loins gird about with truth. So you put that on, you put them on, then you put on the breastplate of righteousness, then your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, then you take the shield of faith, then you take the helmet of salvation, then the lastly you take the sword of the Spirit. Praying, let's say you do that, and <clears throat> you get up in the morning and you, uh, you've done that, you've had your time of devotions if you do it in the morning, and you've chosen to put the armor on, and you get up and you go out into the kitchen or living room and, um, you know, some of your family is up and the phone rings early in the morning and you weren't anticipating the phone ringing. And the phone rings and so one of your kids, one of your teens answers the phone and, uh, and it's uh, so-and-so. It's uh, so-and-so who, you know, they're a little bit upset with you over who knows what. Uh, or they, uh, they're a long talker. Let's say maybe they're a long talker, and you know if you get involved in a phone call that it's going to be a long, long time in that phone call, and you frankly don't have a lot of time this morning, uh, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, you don't have a lot of time to get involved in a long conversation, so you just reach to your, um, you say to your daughter who has answered the phone, your 15-year-old daughter who's watching all your actions and she's learning how to live Christ by watching you in reality uh, more than the things you say, though what you say is very important, how you live, I have found, is the most important thing that you do. And she says, Dad, it's uh, Mr. So-and-so. Um, it's uh, it. I'll pick on me, so no one will think I'm picking on them. It's uh, it's Russ, it's Pastor Russ Porcella, and 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 uh, you say, oh no, he just drags on and on and on and on. He says the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And I don't want to. So just tell him I'm not here. And so yeah, you you you, you, you tell him that you're not here. Yeah, just tell him that I'm not here. I've gone to work already. I'm going to be leaving in a few minutes. I want to suggest to you that you've just taken the belt off. I want to suggest to you, armor is not just something you put on and it's decoration. Armor is what you wear. Now, the analogy from Scripture sure is, it talks about um, we're, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You know, I put the armor on every day. Why is it not working for me? I do this. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I do those things. I lift the shield of faith. And, but you've just told your daughter, just tell them I'm not here. Tell Pastor Russ I'm not here. Or, you know, it could be anybody. It could be the bug man who wants to come and spray your house and you're just not interested in having the house sprayed that day. Maybe that would put too much condemnation on you that it's Pastor Russ. You know, so it's the bug man who wants to come and spray your house. Just tell him I'm not here and I, I can't make that decision because I'm not here. I believe in some significant measure you've just taken the belt off. Because the armor of God is not just words. It's not just words. It is intended to be of great benefit. So if somebody came 
by golly, I'm trying that. I'm doing it. I'm every morning. I'm going through that list, and I've learned it, and I even say it in order, which I think there's significance. Every order in Scripture is significant. Every name, every date, everything is significant. And there's information, insight that can be gained from everything, even the order of the elements in this instance in Ephesians 6. At the same time, everything stands on great merit on its own. So do you have to say it in order? It's, and I'm saying, I'm suggesting to you, I was sitting and praying in the Spirit, and that thought crossed my mind. You've got to live these things. You live them. If you put on, and the starting one, and from what I've read, that it was a pivotal piece. I'm going to start with the one that Ephesians 6 starts with. Um, that uh, it, it was a pivotal piece of the armor. I've heard mentioned that the breastplate actually fit down into a slot in the loins girt about with truth. Uh, the sword was something that was uh, attached to the loins. In some way, it was a major component of, of the armor, of a number of pieces of the armor were dependent on the loins girt about with truth. But, and so um, the thoughts, so that was a thought, and I, I prayed and prayed and prayed about that. Isn't that an interesting idea? Here I am, 68, And I don't know how many times, not every day, but many days, put that armor on, meaning proclaimed it, quoted it, said it out loud. But never did the thought cross me, if I'm going to put on my loins girt about with truth, I'm going to walk in truth. Because truth is available to me. Because Jesus is the way, the truth. And the intention is for us to please Him as we walk. As you'll see, the principalities and powers are mentioned three times in the book of Ephesians. And the first time, it's in mention in reference chapter 1, in reference to Jesus and what God did in Him and raised Him above principalities and powers and rulers and He is lifted up and they're all under His feet. And he is over all of them. That's the first introduction. So it's like that's the foundation. So one of the thoughts as I've been preparing for this series, this will be a series called All Hands on Deck, based out of the book of Ephesians. And so it became, and the thought that came to me, why don't you use as an interpreter the book of Ephesians to understand the book of Ephesians because it was like it was a letter written to an area Gentile churches and it would contain in and of itself insight to help them understand but there's the revelatory wind of the Holy Spirit that brings you ideas and thoughts and I do find the more I pray in tongues the more thoughts come to me I believe that's true for you. The more you pray in the Spirit, the more thoughts will come to you. That you'll pick them up, or it won't be as fuzzy, or the tuner, your, your tuner will be better tuned. It's one of the great, great benefits of praying in the Spirit. The second time it's mentioned, in the middle of the book, it talks about how God's intention is that the church, it's through the church He's going to demonstrate to the principalities and powers what his intentions were for all time, for his counsel, that it's actually through the church, the corporate entity, which it mentions those principalities and authorities. It was his plan all along. He's going to demonstrate through the church. If I look at New Covenant, what happened last year is we began the year talking about the ecclesia. Fasten your seatbelts was a word, a personal word that came to me sitting in a prayer meeting before the New Year's actually began. But we started off talking about the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. That it really was a name for the governmental bodies of cities at that time. 
It wasn't what we know of as buildings and steeples and all the things. And we talked about authority and walking in authority and the kingdom and the purposes that God has for us. And at the end in April is when I had my own personal confirmation of the forerunner calling that God has called me with through the incident that happened where I, we, uh, Gary Beaton and I had a do-little waitress on my birthday on the 30th anniversary of my father's death. At the end of that, several days after that, I thought this is going to be a fabulous year. My goodness. We had had the Katie Sousa conference and uh, there was a lot of work that led up to it, but my goodness, what a conference that was. And it just seemed like. And then there were several things that took place that were very difficult to deal with. And God gave a heads up. Didn't have any idea it was a heads up. Heard about there was a Billy Graham uh, sharing hope in crisis in North Carolina at the Cove, at the Billy Graham um, facility. And Faye and I, Larry and Lynn, and Emily, we went and sharing hope in crisis is intended to equip people to share hope in crisis. That's what we need all hands on deck for. To share hope in crisis. We are making major efforts so I'm just saying to the sound booth, I'm just, I'm mixing everything together. So there's no way you're going to be able to find this order. I apologize. The intention of sharing hope in crisis is to equip people to be able to share hope with those that they encounter. I've thought, who doesn't need sharing hope in crisis or how to minister to people in crisis? And I've discovered in my own thinking, doesn't mean it's accurate, but if you lived by yourself out in the remote woods of Montana, you had no phone, you had no television, you had no ham radio, you had no way of contacting people, you actually had no relatives. I don't, we won't talk about how you came into being, but you have no relatives, you have no friends, you have no neighbors. You don't work. You're independently wealthy and you have everything. You've bought a, a Walmart and you live within a Walmart and it's all fortressed up and you don't need anything. You don't interact with people. You don't meet anybody on a day's basis. You don't go to work. So you, you have no work contact, no relatives, no relationships, no friends. You're by yourself. You're a hermit and, um, and that's how you live life and you're very happy. You're very content. If you live that way, you don't need sharing hope in crisis. Unless you have a crisis and then, you, you know. But in general, sharing hope in crisis is to help prepare you to help people primarily. To help people who are in crisis. And it's intended for everybody. And this year has been quite a quite a wash in realizing there's people deal with the dimension of sin and they need it we need a savior because of sin and that's who Jesus is we need a savior because of offenses of the wrongs that are done to us and say an instant not sins that we have done sometimes seemingly we have no idea why it came it doesn't seem like that's even just and but we have to deal with them. That's why we need a Savior. Jesus has come for that. Man of sorrows, he bore our sorrows. But there's a third big, big dimension. These are big dimensions. And that is grief, loss. We all have loss. Everybody you encounter, they have people who have died who are in their relational contacts. Be it friends, be it family, be it neighbors be it real close children or brothers and sisters or spouses or a little more distance aunts and uncles and grandparents everybody has touched grief you're touching people we're discovering all the time in our culture we don't talk about grief because it's we all it, it, it just is not appropriate it seems 
but you encounter people all the time. So at that, I was so impacted. This was pre-Timothy, our grandson's death. I remember as I sat there thinking, this is incredible. A, the number of people who were there. B, the information. Everybody in this room would benefit. We actually are bringing one of those here. April the 5th, the first Saturday in April. The Billy Graham Rapid Response Team is coming. Members of that Rapid, rapid Response Team organization are coming here to put on Sharing Hope in Crisis. I believe it's among the, one of the major things God is doing here. We are preparing for people. Some of you are very aware of that. If you look about us at the same time period when after, the, after it got started in the winter and early spring and went through that, that conference and, and my own personal thing and went to the Billy Graham thing and uh, sharing hope in crisis and thought, this is great. We all, we all can benefit from this. We need to do this. And then tragedy struck in our own lives. Our grandson, as you know, was killed tragically instantly in an automobile accident. 11 days later, 10 days later, Faye's father died. He was living in our home under hospice. And it was like, and all kinds of problems started happening. And there was great pressure that came for the word's sake, tribulation for the word's sake. to drive away faith, to drive away hope. Because when the word comes, there is, the parable of the sower makes it very clear, there's pressure that's going to come because there's an enemy. But in the midst of all that, it was like God set two things in motion that I want to highly bring to your attention. Sharing hope in crisis. I hope every one of us on the 5th of April it's a Saturday, are here. It's going to cost, but we're charging what they charge. We have to provide lunch. There's this wonderful set of books, manuals that we have to provide for, that we provide you. It's, uh, and Billy Graham, I don't know how they could do this more, with more integrity. What their intention is, they don't want the church, the local church, to suffer financial loss. So their deal is, we're asking you to charge and somewhere between forty and fifty dollars per person that's the cost and it pays for them coming their transportation and their food and lodging and and it, it pays for all of that in addition to the materials and the meal that we serve on saturday for everybody who's attending and their guidelines are we do not want the church to suffer loss so if the expenses exceed the registrations and the amount of money we will cover it. In return, they ask if the money that came in in registration is in excess of all the costs that are incurred, they want you to give them to the Billy Graham Rapid Response Team organization. My opinion is that's incredibly fair. That's incredibly honorable. So I'm urging you, set aside... And while we were attending that in the spring, <clears throat> Larry and Lynn, Emily, Faye and I, while we were attending that, was thinking, this is great. We need to do this. We need to find where this is being done and try and lead people to. And with the passage of time, it just, and prior to the accident, Don and Beth, Beth had the idea. She'd heard about a thing called grief share. And she had the idea, we should put on grief share. Timing is that was set in motion before the accident and dad's death. That was set in motion in our own personal lives. That was already set in motion. And it's like God is preparing us. We're preparing. Why do we need all hands on deck? If you hadn't noticed, we're preparing the building for people. And many of you have participated. The lobby, it was phenomenal. So many participated. It was wonderful. 
So many have participated in this and the whole gamut from putting the bar up and putting the spotlights. Those are rented spotlights at the moment. And the $10,000, it's going to cost us $10,000 to get our own lights. And someone has said, I'll pay, I'll give you a matching of $5,000. And so if everybody comes up with another $5,000, they'll have $10,000. So in essence, the price was cut in half uh, because someone said, I'll be glad to match. I so agree with what's taking place, meaning preparing, changing, uh, bringing in a greater effectiveness in using resources uh, that especially younger generations think is normal uh, and we as some of us many of us a little older generation uh, we're trying to make room and just say we're gonna do it my way our way we're trying to broaden it to such a way that it's more attractive more welcoming we say to a wider range of people you are in our sights you are on our mind we want to include you And we had trouble with our video system last week, which it's just aging is what it is. So we made us put a lot of energy into it this week so we wouldn't have the same thing again, the projector. And somebody donated to the church $12,000, almost essentially $12,000 for that whole system. So there are so many things. If you go downstairs to one of the classrooms that junior high used to be in, you'll find all the stuff is stuck in the middle because it's being painted, because there's work being done. If you you'll look at offices, there's, there some of the offices are renewed. If, if you want a whole journey, uh, an interesting journey, go see Kathy Grizel's office. Um, it's a journey in and of itself. <laughs> it's very sanguinal. I know that's not a word, but if... There's lots of things that are being done to prepare for people, but we all have to prepare to receive people. In addition, in dealing with the pressures that come against us, the tribulation, because there is an enemy, the birds that come and try and take the seed before it even germinates, the cares, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other, other things that try and come in and crowd it and keep it from growing, those are normal parts. We live in an environment of spiritual conflict. It's, it's just the globe, the globe, the world has it. It's interesting that the third place in the book of Ephesians, it, get, it goes to the individual level because the intent is the, Jesus, who is the head, reigns over every name that ever has been named is under him. All principality and power, he was raised to a place. So it's like, the starting place is we are in Christ, what we have is available to us in Christ, and he, that's where his position is. And then it comes in a broader context, in a, app, in, in a broader utilization, and it's God's intention to show to those principalities and powers through the church what has been won in Christ Jesus. And then it's brought down in the book of Ephesians to the third time they're mentioned. Each time it's not the whole list, uh, but principalities is mentioned in each of them, powers. I don't think powers is in Ephesians chapter 1. Each t the third time it's the individual. It's saying you individually put on the whole armor of God so that you, we, each of us individually. Why? Because we're not available to be all hands on deck. If we find ourselves under, set aside, sidetracked, defeated, injured, wounded, taking a vacation, retired. If we find ourselves in those positions and not available, we're not available for all hands on deck. And it's the intention, the book of Ephesians is so clear, the way God has made the body. The intention is everybody is needed. There's parts that you play and can contribute that nobody else can because you're the one who's gifted. You're the one who's enabled. And we all need that part. We all need all the parts. And the good news is God determines what part you are, what part you have, what gifts you have, what enablings you have. God determines that. We don't determine that. God does. We are to give opportunity. All hands on deck means there's something going on and we need everybody to participate. 
there is great preparation going on. So, in part, that's why, and Faye has mentioned this very effectively, that's why we want you here to begin when we begin the worship service, so that you can be ready to enter into worship at the beginning, so that you can, typically visitors come before the service starts. Typically visitors do not arrive late. And so it says something, we say something to visitors when we arrive late and I, I have my, I'm facing the wall, I have no idea who got here when. So he's picking on me, I'm not picking on you, I don't know. But we need all hands on deck. When all hands are on deck, you enter into worship. You enter into receiving people. Just doing the lobby, just changing the platform, just fixing rooms, just addressing things in the congregation. It's people. People interact and impact people. It's people. We know what's right. I had this incident happen this morning. Um, Gene and Rhonda, two of their grandchildren, were sitting on the front row waiting while practice was going on. And their granddaughter had a pretty, I don't know what color it was, I'll say pink, could have been red, could have been blue, pink, big pink bow sitting on her head. And it's common that when it happens, uh, just trying to interact with them, I say, oh, that's a beautiful bow. Could I wear that? Would you let me wear your bow today? No. Please, could I please? I really would like to wear that bow. I think it would look good. I don't know what I would do if they said yes and started to take it off. I... <laughs> I said that two or three times. She said no each time. Finally, her brother, who was sitting next to her, said, You're a boy. Boys don't wear bows. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should have known that. So it's like all of us, we should know it. It's all hands on deck. It's the intention. That's the way God intended the body to work. We should, that should be something we should know, should be obvious to us. So, um, trying to come back, putting on the armor of God, the order. Uh, so, I, I think the book of Ephesians, and I've entitled this All Hands on Deck. I believe a subtitle of the book of Ephesians could easily be All Hands on Deck. It certainly doesn't encompass the whole of the book of Ephesians especially the first three chapters that focus on what God has done for us in Christ, how he has brought Jew and Gentile together. And the last three chapters, certainly, I think you could easily subtitle All Hands on Deck. And so the next slide, if you'll turn to it, I said it's a Navy term, All Hands on Deck. Probably most of you are aware of it. Um, and it's when there's a situation that has arisen. Sometimes it's an opportunity. Sometimes it's a need. Uh, that there is issued and it means that everybody who is even remotely available whether it's your turn or watch meaning um, I guess they they function in teams whether your team has just finished its watch or not all hands on deck intends to mean that everybody everybody who's remotely available we need you we need you on deck we need you available to do what we find ourselves in the midst of and I mean that sometimes it's a great emergency. And at this point in time, I don't mean it for us as a congregation in a time of great emergency. Third screen, loins girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying in the spirit. Um, Ephesians 1.13. Um, I have this up there if you'll show Ephesians 1.13. In him you also trusted after you heard, I'm talking about truth. You heard the word of truth. So I, I looked and I said, okay, let's start with that first one, putting on truth. Okay, what does he say about truth in the book of Ephesians? If I'm going to put on, if it's the starting one, if it's the one you begin with, let's just assume, okay, that's significant. Armor-wise, it is significant. Let's assume that's significant. I wonder what else was addressed asking that particular question in terms of truth in the book of Ephesians, taking that as, okay, this is, this is a one-package deal. And so Ephesians 1.13 is the first mention. In Him you also trusted when you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation is called the word of truth. 
the gospel of salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the first mention of truth. You put on that. Partly, that's what you put on. You put on the word of truth, the gospel. It is the gospel. It's the truth, the real truth. It's in Christ. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love. Oh, my, this is, this is not just a theoretical thing or a positional thing. This is an application. This is, this is what you do. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. That's us. Oh, that means if I put that on, then I'm to speak the truth in love. Not just... I remember a conversation I had with someone and I was talking about husband-wife relationship years ago and I made the comment if Faye came in with a hairdo, I never have one, had one that I didn't like. But let's just say theoretically, she came in with a hairdo that I didn't like. Um, I wouldn't tell her, nah, I don't like that. Um, and there was a guy there, a husband there, he said, you wouldn't tell her you don't like that? No. No, I wouldn't. Why? Because I always try to be careful and take her feelings into consideration. Um, you just don't say everything? No. I don't. Everything you think? No, I don't. He said, well, I do. I, said, I think you've got more problems than I got, too, just judging by... <laughs> speaking the truth in love. Oh, so you don't just speak the truth. You know, you just say whatever you want to say. No, you speak the truth in love. And love takes all kinds of things into consideration. What's this going to do? How is this going to minister? How is this going to impact? How can I? Speaking the truth in love. The next place is Ephesians 4.21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So if you're putting on, the, if you're girding your loins, then it is the tr truth. The truth is in Jesus Christ. What's the truth? Well, I know who's the truth. Jesus is the truth. That, uh, that's what I know. I know who's the truth. And so that's bottom line, ultimately, who I'm trying to please is, is Him, Jesus, who is our life, who is the truth. And then there's Ephesians 4.25. Therefore, putting away lying. How much lying? If you put away lying, that's all lying. That's income tax lying. That's exaggerating. That's hedging. That's lying on the phone. That's uh, misrepresenting information. That's lying that's just hedging that's in our culture we misspeak but it's really lying it's putting away lying so this is the book the whole book uh, part of being on the front lines all hands on deck is being available to be on deck in the environment there's this culture of opposition there's this reality this kingdom more than a culture a kingdom of opposition that's being expressed in culture opposition to Jesus Christ and his lordship in our lives and lying seems to be very much accepted to the point if you're like me I really don't listen much to news because I have come to realize they're probably lying as it is or they're emphasizing some element that's not the truth. And if you're putting on the, the loins girt about with truth, the starting place, then pay attention to the emphasis on truth. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So it's, it's like putting on your loins girt about with truth is a proclamation is an alignment the word of truth the gospel which is about Jesus Christ you are aligning yourself with that it's also a commitment today I'm gonna to walk in truth I'm gonna speak truth I'm gonna answer truthfully and I know some of us, our lives are so entangled, it's like, I can't really do that because there are so many lies. And we wonder, why I'm so defeated? Why doesn't it work when I say 
and I put all the armor on. Why doesn't it work? It's what we live in. It's what we approach the kingdom of darkness that's coming against us in. It's what we wear. It's who we draw upon. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. What's the benefit of that? You're wearing the armor. Oh, but that's hard. There is a tremendous amount of pressure. There's all kinds of pressure. And in our culture, it's in to lie, to misrepresent, to deceive. It's in. And when those in the highest authority are deceiving and misrepresenting the truth, it's like it runs rampant in the land. But the benefit is, it's the armor of God. It's part of the armor. Ephesians 5, 9, it's a terrific verse. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. It's a second place where the fruit of the Spirit is listed. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and we'll come to that next week. We'll talk about that, the breastplate of righteousness. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. That's, mean, that's what He is developing, seeking to develop in you. So if, as uh, I have taken that to heart, that I believe, yes, God was speaking to us through L.A. Marzuli. He was trying to address us. Do these things. Put on the armor of God daily. Then it's something that you wear. It's how you approach life in the light of that. Finding out, Ephesians 5, 9 and 10, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. You mean that's how we're to live? Not what seems good to us or makes us feel good or is easiest on us or causes the least amount of trouble. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out, Lord, I, I want to approach life as it's acceptable to you. What is the advantage of that? It's the armor. That yes, the victory Jesus won and he's above it. It's God's intention that the church, the corporate entity, demonstrate to the principalities and powers his wisdom. It is part of his overarching plan, but it also finds its expression in the every person, in the all hands, in every one of us putting on the armor of God. But it's a way we approach life. It's the way we live. It's the, the core of the decision-making process. What is acceptable to the Lord? What pleases Him? But you keep that armor on. You're in, you are in harmony. You're in agreement. The second thing that came to me over the past several weeks is the individual and corporate focus to Ephesians 6.18. Now, if you'll turn to Ephesians 6.18, I've had you in chapter 6, to Ephesians 6.18. We focused on the front part of the verse, praying always with all prayer. So I believe all that armor is prayer armor. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And I believe that does mean praying in tongues. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance. I believe this end is taking the whole passage into context. Is that the intention is that we would stand against the wiles of the devil. And we would withstand and be able to stand. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So you take the armor so you can withstand, stand against, 
successfully resist and occupy your position of standing, staying in your place. And with being watchful to this end, <clears throat> with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And I realize there is a corporate dimension for all the saints. But God's intention for me is not that I make it, I made it through this battle. I made it. But the intention is, yes, it comes back to the corporate entity, the church, through whom God is bringing a demonstration of the victory over principalities and powers that was earned for us in Christ, who has risen above all that and is seated above all that, and His name is above all that. But it's individually fought, it's corporately fought. We're in a time period when we are corporately preparing, and so I want to suggest to you, please save your money. It's between 40 and 50 bucks that it's going to cost. Please save your money. We have to give the names of 30 churches and email addresses of 30 churches. They will send out emails. The Billy Graham Association will send out emails to everybody in the district, I mean, down as far as Atlanta. It will fill up quickly. As soon as registrations open, we were going to go up into Virginia, and it closed. It was closed so quickly because it filled up. We probably, according to the paper in the back, can fit 400 people in here. Because I believe that God is preparing us in the pathway, in going and then seeing grief share set in motion, then the events that happened that were unanticipated and discovered how much the insight and information we learned, how beneficial that would have been to at least some in our congregation who we interacted with, that it would have been better if they'd heard that in how they chose to interact with us. And it taught me how much we need this. So looking at what's taking place, we're preparing for people. That first grief share had, I didn't keep track of the numbers, but it seemed it had as many people who were not a part of this congregation as people who were a part of this congregation. Or it was a significant amount for people who are not a part of this congregation. I suggest to you, there's three things being offered this, this coming, this year during Wednesday nights. All three of them, all hands on deck, do one of them. Grief share is being offered. Everybody would benefit. You could say, I'm not going through grief right at the moment. How do you get on deck? Truth. That when you put the belt of truth on in the morning, yes, it is a proclamation, it is a declaration, but it's a commitment and it's a way you're living that day. I am living in truth. I am going to be a person of truth. Pleasing the Lord. That's who I'm going to try and please. The Lord. Not my culture. Not follow the public leadership and what so many are. Not all, but so many are. That's how you, it's all hands on deck. And starting in the dimension, I'm going to put that armor on. I'm going to live that way. I'm going to live in truth. How I approach life is going to be in agreement, in harmony, synchronized with what I'm wearing, what I've put on, so to speak. But we're doing three things. And what will make us function more effectively corporately is if you join us, all hands on deck. Meaning, I would recommend to everybody in the room, take grief share. Don and Beth won't know what to do, but good, that would be a good problem. Let them face that problem. Why? Because you have people in your past who have died. You have people that in the future will die. You interact with people all the time. People you bump into all the time in grocery stores have people who have died. Or losses, significant losses. 
you will learn so much about the process of grieving. How universal it is, how different it is. You will prepare yourself. It's, a, it's like, I believe God's preparing us because I think there's great tragedies. I mean, just pay attention to the news. They're mounting, they're increasing. What's going on in our country? The cold. We'll suffer from some cold. We won't have feet of snow. But the tragedies that are occurring, I believe God is preparing us to be a people who can share hope in crisis. It's what's happening. But it's all hands on deck. It's not, it's not the three or four or ten or fifteen. I believe it's all hands on deck. It's for everybody. You can do that. You're permitted to come whether you've just had a recent death or not. To learn, what do you do? How do you try and help people? What can I look for? Grandchildren, if a grandparent dies, like Faye's dad died, there's grandchildren. We are watching some of that as it takes place in our house. There are children, there's great-grandchildren, there's grandchildren, there's spouses. All of those are being impacted. If we're going to share hope in crisis, and I believe during these first four months, uh, and what God did during the year is Katie Sousa preparing our hearts, being cleansed, being freed, dealing with uh, guilt, dealing with oppression, dealing with bondage, dealing with things that would seek to attach itself and cause hindrances to us, focusing on the blood of Jesus, the resurrection, the light, the glory light. James Lowry on Wednesday nights also is going to be showing some, listening to, showing some of the Katie Sousa materials and have soaking sessions. You might say, I just, because I'm not dealing with grieving right now, it's hard for me to say, yeah, I, but it's going to come, so, all right. And I've, I've spent a lot of time doing that. Larry King is going to be showing another one of Dutch Sheets, an intercessory prayer, a video series. Those are excellent. There's three excellent things being done on Wednesday nights that will start in a week or two. They're excellent. It's part of how do I get on deck, all hands on deck. Put the armor on. Make the commitment starting just this week with truth. I'm going to walk in truth. I'm going to put it on. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to proclaim it. But I'm going to, I'm going to live that way. That's how I'm going to live today. Truth. If truth has not been a part of what you've done or there's been a lot of mixture in there, will it be difficult? Probably will. Call on the name of Jesus again and again. If it's been a weak spot, call on the name of Jesus. Repent of it. Call upon the blood of Jesus, His resurrection. It's the gospel. It's the word of truth. What's been given to us in Christ Jesus. I do believe as we get go through different aspects of the book of Ephesians, God's clear intention was all hands on deck. And the body grows. What is taking place? We are preparing to be available to people and I believe a key dimension is sharing hope in crisis. I do mean in the context of the Billy Graham rapid response team. I mean in the broad context of life and people and what's taking place in our nation. And the number of people who are grieving and suffering loss is increasing by virtue of the tragedies that we see multiplying in our land, a nation that's gone wild. All hands on deck is participating, it's helping, it's contributing, it's being a part. Everybody doing everything? No. You contributing in the areas and the parts that you are able to. But all hands on deck. Put the armor on. Wear it. It has to do also with how you live. Wednesday night. When Grief Share starts in several weeks, attend Grief Share or attend Larry King's, the 
uh, DVD series by Dutch Sheets on intercessory prayer or the soaking session uh, that James Lowry is going to host in here on Katie Sousa, the blood of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Is all hands on deck. It's God's intention that the body be that way. So in that, I'm greatly excited. You could spend your time focusing on who's not here. I believe God is preparing us for those who are to come, and it appears there is the likelihood they'll come with pretty heavy crisis needs. I believe we are being given an opportunity to prepare ahead of time. Buy up the moment. As been, has been said long ago, the opportunity of a lifetime has to be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. We are preparing. Enter in. There's more preparing that's going to be done. We're preparing. All hands on deck. If you'll bow your heads with me.